Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Norton Natural Schools A-Level Politics uh, introduction session. Uh, my name is Mr. Gray. I'm the head of politics here, as I am the head of uh, history. And uh, if you've just sat through the history session, well done and welcome back. And if not, if you're uh, uh, new to uh, my sessions, then thank you for joining me. There will be some, uh, 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 hopefully some, some music and things in this. Um, I'm hoping the technology is going to work. I have no idea actually if the technology worked particularly well in the last session. Uh, it'd be great to get some feedback. If any of you uh, witnessed the history uh, session, do give me uh, an email and tell me what worked and what didn't work. Uh, all feedback very much appreciated. OK, so we will make a start. So the uh, agenda for today, uh, we're going to start off with a uh, taster clip. We will move on to course information. We're going to talk then about transition work and then we're going to have an activity based on uh, UK and US politics. OK, uh, if you can hear a bit of noise in the background, that is the lesson changeover. Um, it will settle down soon, hopefully. Uh, so apologies for that if that's disturbing you. OK, so as promised, that was our uh, politics A-level taster clip. Hopefully that's got you thinking about some of the uh, major issues we talk about and how that can link to your life uh, and get you interested. Um, we will move now on to uh, some information about the course. And I'm going to click through these. I think really the, the, the clip there did sort of sum up a lot of these things. <laughs> And uh, you can see here some of the benefits of studying politics A-level. 
again, hopefully they were summarized in the in the video. I won't uh, labor the point too much on those. One thing I will perhaps add is. Why now? Why is studying politics now uh, uh, perhaps more interesting than in, in, in previous years, maybe sort of 15 years ago, that kind of thing? And that's largely because of the uh, sort of unpredictability of uh, of politics at the moment. Uh, the last few years has seen things which, um, you know, only five years ago, six years ago may have seemed impossible to achieve. Uh, and again, people have different opinions on on things like Brexit and Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, but uh, they've all made, you know, people surprised really in one way or another. And of course, hanging over all of us at the moment is the uh, COVID pandemic. Of course, COVID is a medical issue, it's a scientific issue, but it has huge political implications, economic implications. Um, uh, those are beyond doubt. The question is, um, you know, uh, what what are the solutions to those problems? Uh, you know, and is the government doing a, a good job or not so good job? And if if not, then what's the alternative? So plenty of things really to, to keep you interested. And, you know, the, the by the end of the A-level course, what we'll be talking about will probably, you know, we will follow the spec and everything, but it will be a different world by that point, um, given that everything's moving so quickly and it's it's pretty unpredictable how we're going to uh, pan out in the next couple of years. So plenty to keep you interested and politics can help you, uh, studying politics can help you make sense of all of that, I hope. OK, so a bit more course information now, I hope. On your screen, you can see the three key elements of the uh, NKS politics A level. Uh, this is uh, an AQA exam board course, the same as the uh, history A level and history GCSE. There are three exams, paper one, two and three. There is no coursework, no NEA non-examined assessment, just three exams. And as you can see there, they are all two hour exams and each of them is worth one third of the A level. Paper one on the far left there, uh, UK government and UK politics. Uh, both paper one and paper two are sort of divided along those lines. The government on the one hand, um, politics on the other. Um, it's sort of a, a, div a division of the course and uh, I tend to cover the government side of things. The other teacher, Mr. Uh, Snare, tends to cover the, the politics side of things, uh, government politics. Um, two hour exam, worth a third. And the middle here, paper two. As you can see, uh, USA, US government and politics, I guess we should call it. There is also a comparative element. So paper two actually is not just about the USA. There's a bit of UK stuff in there as well so that you can compare it. And there are specific questions asking you to draw comparisons. Our activity later on today will be related to just that, drawing comparisons, similarities and differences between the different systems. OK, uh, what a fantastic time to be studying uh, US politics we have. The um, the first and possibly only uh, Donald Trump presidency now in its entirety in history that we can study and who knows by the time uh, we get to the end of your A-level course, you know, we will be at uh, the the uh, uh, not long, you know, uh, around the time of the midterms and people will start thinking about the uh, uh, 2024 presidential election, and whether or not Donald Trump will be in a position to run at that time is anybody's guess. Uh, paper three that you can see on the far right here, uh, as you can see, political ideas. Uh, so this is very much the odd one out uh, of the um, politics topics. OK, uh, you have to study three core political ideas, conservatism, socialism and liberalism. And then we have uh, beyond that, we have a choice of what to study and we will be studying anarchism, which is I guarantee you not what you think it is. OK, there will be m many elements of anarchism that you'll be surprised by. Um, it is a two hour exam worth a third of the A level. Uh, for many people, this is the reason why they sign up, because they want to study this further. Uh, maybe, you know, that maybe they 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 want to get beyond the sort of cut and thrust of current affairs and kind of uh, governments and parties and elections. That's one layer of politics. But beneath it all really is a sort of a philosophical uh, discussion about ideas um, and the history of ideas. So paper three will give you a grounding in all of those things. 
as I mentioned in the, uh, well, as I think it was shown in the in the intro, Taste of Day video for this, uh, politics comes up. If you go to university, it comes up in lots of different courses in ways that you might not expect. And so studying it at A level can really, really help you. I have lots of ex students when they come back and see me, they tell me, you know, they're going to study geography or English, you know, humanities subjects mainly, uh, but also business studies, the law, obviously. And they come back and say, well, look, the, you could tell on those courses, the, the students who had studied politics at A levels because they were so far advanced when it came to talking about those issues and how they link to things. Things like uh, uh, geography, business studies and the law and that kind of thing. It is a topic which fits really well with my other subject history and uh, we have lots of students who do both those uh, topics. They they uh, they dovetail really nicely. They complement each other. Uh, one one example of that is, um, you know, you, you will study Russian history and the Russian Revolution. And of course, in paper three there, we have, um, you know, the, the history of, of socialism and communism and Karl Marx and Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg. You know, that's just one example. Um, likewise, in um, the, the uh, coursework element for the history A level, uh, there's a, a, a discussion of US foreign policy and if you've studied the US Constitution that can help you understand you know how foreign policy is made and how the president is involved how Congress is involved and again students um, uh, uh, who kind of study both history and politics tend to see the links better than those who, who don't so a little plug there for history as well but uh, whatever you decide to do uh, of course we will we will support you uh, in, in the best way we can OK, so that's the course structure. I'll just pause here for a moment and let you take in uh, what's on the screen. So uh, hopefully you have um, in your possession the transition work document or booklet um, that was uh, provided by the school. If you haven't got it with you, dig around in all the material that was sent to you. Uh, it's probably a Word document. All of the uh, departments at school have suggested transition work, transition from year 11 into A level, from GCSE to A level. And um, for politics, uh, there's plenty that you can be getting on with. Of course, you can read good political journalism. Um, the best politics students, the most successful politics students tend to read broadsheet newspapers. Um, and by that we mean uh, Guardian, Times, Telegraph, that kind of thing. Uh, some of them you have to pay for. Um, the Guardian, uh, although it's not to everyone's taste, uh, I believe is is the most open access, I think. Um, and You know, students who are interested in politics tend to read those uh, things anyway. Uh, don't feel like if you read your, you know, your Twitter feed or your Facebook uh, feed or that kind of thing, don't feel like that is keeping up with the news. It's it's not. That's not what we mean. We mean reading and accessing good political journalism. OK, that includes podcasts and things like that. Don't get me wrong. I like Twitter. Uh, I like social media stuff. But, um, you know, if you if you really want to do this properly and get ahead of the other students, then, you know, do yourself a favor, access decent political journalism. BBC News is pretty good. It's pretty impartial, despite the uh, um, suggestions to the contrary. Um, you know, Newsnight's really good. Radio 4, current affairs programs, today program every morning and um, the uh, uh, Week in Westminster, various podcasts are available on, on current affairs for both American and uh, UK politics. Um, I can make some more of those available for you if you want me to, uh, please feel free to email me. However, to get to the actual transition work that I've given you, um, we subscribe to a website called pre -Tued Politics, um, which uh, you know basically is set up to try to explain um, most, I would say most, not all, most of the A-level politics course. Uh, it's designed for all the exam boards, so it's not particularly AQA based, but it's still pretty good. Uh, 
And so, uh, you know, feel free now if you want to on, a, on another tab on your computer, uh, Google pre politics and you'll find the website if the link doesn't work for you. Uh, it will ask you for a username. The username is my email address, which is there on the board. And the password is DC versus VS versus DC versus Hella. OK, 2008. And uh, if you're if you're wondering what DC versus Heller was, it's a famous gun rights Supreme United States Supreme Court uh, case and judgment in 2008. So if you're interested in you know, gun rights in America and that whole debate, DC versus Heller was a, a, a key court case for that. And my thinking with using that as a password is that it will help everyone remember that famous court case. OK, so you put the username in, put the password in and you can access a huge number of online lectures relating to the politics course. Each one lasts around 15 minutes and is accompanied by a question sheet for you to fill out. The videos are divided into chapters with around five to ten videos per chapter. Um, there's not much Corona stuff in there, but apparently they are hoping to update that with you know Corona political stuff uh, in, in the coming months and years. Um, for transition work, there is there is no compulsion to do this, um, uh, but students who do the summer work will be at an advantage. And particularly last summer when we had uh, um, a lot of students stuck at home during the, the lockdown towards the end of, of year 11 and into the summer holidays, we had lots of students who did uh, a great deal of these, these lectures. And what that meant was that when in year 13, when the course started and I say, uh, you know, I said for homework, go away and watch this video and take notes, it meant that they had already done it. And you know they were able to then to just read over their notes or rewatch the video, but it saved them time and it meant gave them more time to do other things and do wider reading and that kind of stuff. So it meant that those students were ahead of the game. So again, get yourself a cheeky advantage and do some of the transition work. If you run out of that, if you if you complete pre tuned politics, I don't know if it's possible. To, uh, have I ever completed pre tuned politics? I don't think I have. But if you have completed it, or if you get bored of it and you want some different politics stuff to do, just email me and I will come up with some good ideas as quickly as possible in the summer months. OK, pre tuned politics. Moving on. So. At this point, we are going to have uh, an activity. I'm going to throw some questions at you and I'm going to ask you uh, to uh, uh, think about these and see if you can come up with an answer uh, for these questions regarding the United Kingdom and the United States of America. OK, so we'll do the first one together here. Is the Constitution contained in a single document explaining the system of government? Constitution means the system the way it works, the plan, the layout. OK, and the question here is, is all that stuff contained in one system of government in the United Kingdom? The answer is no, there is no one single document. There are just lots of laws, books and conventions which have evolved over several centuries. OK, so the answer in the UK is no. The answer in the US, however, is yes, there is one single document, the US Constitution. It's 4,543 words long. It's written in 1787 and it has been changed, amended 27 times since uh, its creation. OK, it fits very nicely at the back of a textbook. It's not that long. Uh, the, the Constitution surprisingly short in many ways. In spite of that, it's highly unlikely that Donald Trump has ever read it. Yeah, I'm going to stand by that one. Donald Trump has never read the US Constitution. OK, so what I'm going to do is move on to the next question. I think there's 12 of these questions. If you want to keep a tally of which ones you're getting correct, and which ones you're getting wrong, uh, feel free. At any point you want to, you can look these things up and uh, or if you want to test yourself, that's absolutely fine as well. OK, a lot of what we do in the early part of the course is looking at misconceptions that people have about political systems in the United Kingdom and the USA, explaining things like government, and parliament, and Congress, and, uh, you know, that kind of thing, really getting to the bottom of some of these key terms so that you have a secure understanding of what they mean uh, for, 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 the, for the rest of the course. OK, so question two coming up. Who is the head of state in these 
nations. I'm going to pause it here and let you have a think. OK, so the answers. In the United Kingdom, the head of state is whoever is the monarch. OK, whoever's the queen, uh, Elizabeth II at the moment, uh, or a, a, a king in the future, Charles probably next. Uh, that is the what we mean by the head of state. In the United States of America, the head of state is the president. The presidency. OK. And there's a clue about a future question there. The president is really fulfills more than one constitutional role here. OK, head of state is one of them. Next question. How does the head of state get their job? OK, I'll pause for a few seconds. So the head of state gets their job in different ways on either side of the Atlantic in the United Kingdom. It is inherited. It's through birth. It's through bloodline. It's a monarchy. Uh, that's the way monarchies uh, tend to work. And so it is by blood. By chance of birth, you might say. In the United States of America, the head of state gets their job through an election. OK, they are elected. Uh, the US presidential election is probably more complicated than many people think. And that's one of the big topics that Mr. Snare will be going into the electoral college process and all the benefits and drawbacks of that. A big, big part of uh, American political debate. OK, how do you get on with that one? Let's move on. Question four. How much power does the head of state have in each of those countries? How much power? How much influence? What can they do that they wouldn't have been able to do uh, if they were not the head of state in those countries? Think of it that way. OK, 10 seconds to think. Well, the answer, uh, I suppose it is a little bit debatable. Uh, but the answer is in the United Kingdom, the head of state, the monarch. It, historically, they were, depending on who you, who you believe, they were either all powerful or very powerful, that kind of thing. But over the centuries, if you know anything about your English history, British history, over the centuries, uh, centuries of evolution have seen the power of the monarchy shift to two other institutions in Britain, the uh, uh, parliament on the one hand, and the government. Now, at this point, you might be thinking parliament, government, aren't they the same thing? Isn't it just, you know, politicians? No, of course, these are different things. And that's one of the big misconceptions that we will be dealing with, um, you know, for some students anyway, uh, in the beginning months. In the United States, the head of state, well, there's different ways of looking at this, but uh, what I've got written here, they are the single most powerful individual in the political system. But many, many people, presidents maybe sometimes, are surprised by the number of constraints upon this at first glance powerful person. OK, there's lots of limitations on their power. There's lots of things that they can't do. And, uh, you know, we, we are coming, uh, we're on the, uh, the, the uh, We've seen an entire Donald Trump presidency and in many ways Donald Trump was surprised at the things that he wasn't allowed to do. Um, so. How much power do they have? How do you get on with that one? Let's move on. Question five. Who is the head of government? Should be a question mark there. Please imagine a question mark at the end of that question. Uh, so I've put in there in the brackets there who is the head of government who's in charge of implementing laws who's in charge of executing laws executing implementing that means 
quite quite often governments are known as executives or the executive branch. So who is the head of government in both those countries? A few seconds. OK, in uh, the United Kingdom, the answer is the prime minister, the head of government. I guess in, in Britain we call it Her Majesty's government and the prime minister is the head of that government. In the United States of America, the head of government is the president. There was a hint on the previous slide, wasn't there? They're both head of state and head of government, so they have a, excuse me, a, a dual role in uh, this process. Perhaps that makes them more powerful, perhaps it doesn't. Probably it gives them greater status. So when the president shakes hands with the prime minister, the president is uh, really a higher status individual than the prime minister. And that's not just because America is, is uh, wealthier or has a bigger military or anything like that. It's because the president is a head of state as well as head of government. The prime minister cannot claim to be head of state uh, in this country. Of course, that's the monarch. OK. Straightforward, you got that one? Interesting, let's move on. Question six, how does the head of government get their job? How do they end up in that position? A few seconds to work it out. Well, the answer is, in the United Kingdom, the head of government, the prime minister, is appointed by the head of state. OK, appointed, in other words, by the monarch. Uh, the head of state normally chooses someone who can command a majority in parliament, which effectively means being the leader of the biggest single party in parliament. OK, normally that happens after an election. At the moment, uh, it's the Conservative Party who uh, has a majority in parliament. And the leader of the Conservative Party is Boris Johnson. And uh, of course, he was appointed as prime minister. Remember, Boris Johnson was prime minister before the last general election at the end of 2019. And when he during his first premiership, I guess you might call it before the 2019 election, he did not have a, a majority. Remember, he took over from Theresa May, who actually lost the Conservative Party's majority. So for a while, uh, both Theresa May, Boris Johnson as leaders of the Conservative Party were prime ministers without a clear majority in parliament. And that led to all sorts of problems. Uh, you know, getting Brexit done, for example, uh, was was pretty difficult. Calling elections was pretty difficult. And so, uh, you know, one way to get around that was to have an election. And in that election 2019, the Tories, Tories is, is uh, if you don't know, is, is a nickname for the Conservatives, won a clear majority. And that's how Boris Johnson ended up as prime minister in the United States. Very simple. Head of government is elected because that's the president. Yeah, there's one election for the presidency and uh, that, 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 that performs those two different roles. OK, I wonder if you got the complexities of that. Probably you did because you're very clever. We will move on. Number seven. Again, uh, just to remind you, there's about 12 questions of this. Uh, so we're on number seven. To whom is the head of government accountable? I.e., who is their boss? Who do they have to answer to? A few seconds to think about that. OK, you may think this one is pretty straightforward, but it's uh, a little bit more uh, uh, complex than you might think. In the United Kingdom, they are what we would call directly accountable to Parliament and indirectly accountable to voters. Remember, when you vote in a general election, you don't vote for a prime minister. There are, you know, you uh, you don't put a cross next to a prime minister's name in a general election. You vote for a local MP. Um, of course, a lot of people will vote for their MP based on who the leader of their party is. So, you know, if you vote for a, a Tory MP in your local constituency in Ashford, that's Damien Green. It may be that you're voting for Damien Green in the hopes that that will bring Boris Johnson uh, uh, into the into number 10. Uh, but uh, the reality is that actually, you know, we constitutionally we don't elect a prime minister. The prime ministership is 
in reality an unelected position. They are appointed by the monarch, but by convention they appoint somebody who has, is the leader of a party who ha can claim to have some kind of uh, democratic uh, legitimacy, some kind of democratic mandate to govern. OK, so it's a bit more complicated than you might think. OK, but on a day to day, week to week basis, the government headed by the prime minister has to answer to parliament. And that's what prime minister's questions are. Yep, um, they are directly accountable to parliament. Theoretically, parliament can also dismiss a government. Of course, governments tend to have a majority in parliament, so it's quite difficult to do that, but it is uh, uh, possible. OK, indirectly accountable to voters in America. To whom is the head of government accountable? The president, who are they accountable to? Are they accountable to Congress? Well, the reality is that in America, they are directly accountable to the people. They are directly accountable to the voters. And that's because they are voted in, in a way that prime minister is not directly voted in. Yep. Um, they are, in America, the president is directly accountable to the people. You might say indirectly accountable to Congress. Congress is supposed to investigate the president and highlight their, 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 their weaknesses and poor decisions, whatever that might be. But Congress um, is not supposed to be able to get rid of the president uh, uh, just at will. OK, it is possible to get rid of a president theoretically through the impeachment process, but that's supposed to be for high crimes and misdemeanors. That's supposed to be for serious criminal wrongdoing, uh, whereas in Britain, theoretically, it's possible for Parliament to dismiss um, uh, uh, the government and the prime minister just because they don't like them or they don't like their policies, even if they haven't done anything sort of criminally wrong. In America, uh, it's quite different. So the long and the short of it is in America, the president is directly accountable to the people. One might argue that Donald Trump was held accountable uh, to the people at the last US election. Of course, he saw it somewhat differently. OK, question eight. How are government ministers chosen in the United Kingdom and the USA? Five seconds. OK, the reality is in the United Kingdom. They are appointed by the head of government, appointed by the prime minister. Um, government uh, ministers must first be members of parliament. OK, they have to be an MP first. Theoretically, you can be a member of the House of Lords as well, but there's not too many of those. One, one or two of those are usually appointed to the government. Uh, the vast majority of government ministers are appointed out of uh, the 650 uh, members of parliament. OK, you can't be in the government as a proper minister unless you are first elected to parliament. In the United States, it's quite different. You're appointed by the president. Probably you will be uh, familiar with that. Or at least you will have worked that out. But they have to be confirmed by Congress. So they're actually the point is perhaps not the right word, nominated by the president and confirmed by Congress. Congress is the US version of parliament. In, in Britain, Boris Johnson doesn't have to ask Parliament if he can appoint, you know, um, uh, Sajid Javid uh, as health secretary, as as was the case uh, recently uh, to the time of recording. Doesn't have to ask Parliament that. In America, however, the president has to ask Congress to support their appointments to to the government. OK, in America, no one is allowed to be simultaneously a member of the government and Congress. So in the United Kingdom, you have to be a member of parliament before you enter the government. In a, uh, sorry, in Britain, you have to be a, a member of parliament before you're in the government. In America, it's quite the opposite. You're not allowed to be in Congress if you're gonna be in government. If you are in Congress and the president wants you to be a member of the government, uh, you if, if once, once you've been appointed, you have to give up your seat in Congress. Okay, that does sometimes happen. Uh, a lot of the time, president will uh, nominate people from outside Congress, businessmen, academics, um, you know, lawyers, that kind of thing. Okay, next question. What name is given to the assembly or the institution which creates laws? OK, I'll try and move a bit a little bit quicker for this. We have mentioned them both uh, in the previous slides. And as you can see here, we have Parliament and Congress. These are what you call law making bodies. You might call them legislatures. OK, that's their formal name, legislatures, legislature, legislation, legal. It all means to do with laws. They pass laws by voting on them. There we have it. How do you get on with that? 
Very good. OK, question 10. How are members of the law creating assembly chosen? Pretty straightforward, right? They are elected by the people, or at least I guess we might say elected by their in their local constituency. And in America, elected again by the people, or uh, in, in Congress, uh, there there's different different uh, sort of constituencies. We'll go into that uh, in a minute, but yeah, elected. Very good. Next question. We are nearly there. Question 11, how many chambers are there in the law making assembly? And by that I mean official uh, uh, institutions within the legislature. If you're not sure what this means, it will all become clear momentarily. Can you work it out? In the United Kingdom, there are two chambers. So we have the House of Commons and the House of Lords. I'm sure you've heard of those before. Part of what we'll be studying is the relationship between these things, uh, certainly on my side of the course, and you know why, why we have two chambers and what their powers are and that type of thing. In the United States of America, simil similar but also different. Uh, we have two again. In America, in Congress, we have the House of Representatives and the Senate. So that's the two. OK, uh, one of the major differences you might have spotted is the House of Lords is not elected. The House of Commons is elected. House of Lords is actually appointed. OK, you can't get rid of them by voting them out, the House of Lords, whereas in America, both uh, chambers are elected in different ways. But nevertheless, it is possible for people to vote out uh, uh, members of both chambers of Congress in America. OK, the last question. Are you keeping tally of your marks? I'd be interested to know how many you got. Question 12. How easy is it to change the constitution? By constitution, remember, we mean the, uh, the, the official system of government, if you like. OK, if you want to change it, how easy is it in the United Kingdom? How easy is it to change it in America? Quick think. OK, the answer coming up is it's relatively easy in the United Kingdom. Changing the constitution is legally no different from passing a regular law in Parliament requiring 50% plus MPs. OK, so if you've got a majority in Parliament and they, all those MPs do as they're told uh, uh, from, you know, by their leader, then it's relatively easy for a prime minister to change the constitution by law. In America, it's somewhat different. It's relatively difficult. Even to begin the process requires two thirds support in both houses of Congress, i.e. the House of Representatives and the Senate. So that's quite a difficult thing to achieve to get two thirds support to change the Constitution. And even once you've got that, it then gets handed over to the states, the states being all of the 50 states of the United States. So Florida, Texas, uh, New York, uh, Colorado. I won't go through the 50. I wouldn't be able to. Maybe you can. Uh, that's not one of my skills. Uh, but the, each of those states has their own way of uh, ratifying, confirming constitutional changes. And perhaps because it's so difficult to achieve or relatively difficult to achieve, it's hardly surprising that we end up with only 27 changes to the Constitution. Some of them pretty major, no doubt about it, but nevertheless only 27 formal changes to the Constitution since 1787. OK, well done. Tally up your marks. Email me your results if you want to. I'll put my email address up on the board if you want it again in a moment. Um, yep, well done if you got uh, some of those correct. Uh, excellent if you got all of them correct. If you didn't get any right or you're pretty disappointed with your mark, don't worry because we will cover all of this in the coming weeks and months. Quick reminder about the transition work. Do yourself a favor, do as much of that as possible, consistent with your own <laughs> mental health and physical health and having uh, you know, a rest over summer. Uh, but you know, remember, students who do that stuff will be at an advantage. OK, I think I have my email coming up on the next screen. There we have it. Thank you very much for sticking with me on the politics A-level uh, taster session. Um, if I've not covered something or if I've uh, if you couldn't understand what I was saying, do do please let me know and uh, uh, you know uh, give me an email. 
I look forward to seeing you in September. Thank you very much again for joining me. Have a great summer. Bye bye.